Good morning, everybody. The webinar will begin in approximately one minute. Hello and thank you for joining us today for what promises to be a fascinating discussion on a very important and live topic. My name is Lewis Johnston. I'm the Assistant Director for Policy and External Affairs at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and I'm very pleased to be chairing this joint CIR Law Society discussion today with such a distinguished panel of speakers. CIR is a global professional body for all forms of dispute resolution, and we promote and facilitate arbitration and ADR as an alternative means of address to the courts. We provide training and accreditation, as well as professional practice guidelines and cutting edge insight on issues affecting arbitration and ADR. Our 17,000 members around the world operate across a wide range of practice areas, and our extensive branch network facilitates a global community and the effective exchange of ideas. We've been closely following developments in the Brexit process, including the question of UK reaccession to Lugano and the implications of the trade and cooperation agreement entered into in January this year, and the potential impacts of those uh, developments on legal services in general and arbitration and ADR in particular. As I said, we're delighted to be partnering with the Law Society of Eng England and Wales today um, and, uh, with this event. The Law Society works to represent, support and promote the interests of its members across the globe. It represents more than 160,000 solicitors from all branches of the profession, practicing as sole solicitors, in-house, in-high street firms and big international firms. Many of its members act for parties in arbitration and mediation, and many are arbitrators and mediators themselves. The Law Society has been working to evaluate the consequences of Brexit for its members and their clients since the referendum in 2016, and realized early on that dispute resolution was one of the crucial matters which could be adversely affected by the UK leaving the EU. It has been striving since to make sure a coherent and certain system of dispute resolution is available to all, advocating the UK rejoining of Lugano. It also recognises the importance of having a wide panorama of means of dispute resolution available and the fundamental role held by arbitration in the landscape of redress for, for parties. I'm delighted that we're, uh, we're able to partner with the Law Society today uh, and I'm also delighted that many in our audience uh, are, are from uh, either members of the Chartered Institute or, ind or indeed the Law Society or indeed both. Uh, so welcome uh, and thank you for joining us. Clearly, these are, are very important issues we're discussing. Uh, the status of the UK with regards to Lugano remains unresolved. And as many of you will already know, the European Commission last month advised against allowing, to, allowing the UK to rejoin Lugano. This isn't the end of the story. The final word is now with the member states through the Council of, Euro of the European Union. Norway, Iceland and Switzerland have already made clear their support for reaccession. But some believe that other EU states see an opportunity here to challenge the UK's leading status as a dispute resolution hub. Our panellists today will discuss what this means, what the prospects of rejoining are, what the perspectives are from the UK and indeed from, from Brussels, and indeed to what extent it matters, um, particularly for, for arbitration. We will also discuss the wider question of Brexit and the trade and cooperation agreement, including what it might mean for legal services in general and arbitration in particular. We may also touch upon the wider macro question of the competitive landscape for international arbitration, particularly in the wake of the publication of the latest Whiten case, uh, Queen Mary University of London International Arbitration Survey. Uh, again uh, last month. 
we want this to be a live discussion, so please do submit your questions using the Q&A button. We have set aside some time at the end of the session to address these questions specifically, but please do submit throughout. If your question is relevant uh, and lively enough, we will certainly throw it into the discussion at hand in real time, as it were. So now to our, our panel. Uh, on our panel today, we have Philippa Charles, Partner and Head of International Arbitration at Stewart's. Philippa specialises in complex and high value cross-border arbitration disputes and has 20 years experience of proceedings before major arbitral institutions. We're also lucky to be joined by Stuart Dutson, partner and international head of arbitration at Simmons & Simmons. While Stuart's primary practice is in English law arbitrations and investment treaty arbitrations seated throughout the world, he has conducted many arbitrations in Europe, including applying both EU and national European states laws. Eric White from Herbert Smith Freehill, Freehills also joins us today. Uh, Eric is an EU and international trade lawyer with over 35 years experience, as well as advising a wide range of clients on trade and regulatory matters. Eric regularly contributes to legal journals and has written, written frequent commentaries on the Brexit process uh, through his View from Brussels series. And I, I certainly hope he'll be giving us the, the View from Brussels today. And finally, Jonathan Wood, Head of International Arbitration at RPC, and indeed the Chair of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Board of Trustees. Welcome all. So I, I wanted to start really with setting out some of the, 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 the background to, to the questions at hand here today. Uh, and I wondered, Jonathan, if you could, could start us off with a, a summary of the, the background to Lugano and the Brussels regime since 1968, and your own experience of, uh, of interacting with, um, with cases under that framework. I, I believe you're just on, on mute, Jonathan. Yes, it's become <laughs> the lingua franca of the Zoom call. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much, Lewis, and uh, welcome to you all and to my fellow, fe uh, fellow panellists this morning, uh, and a wet morning it is here. Um, one expression that emerged during the case history uh, relating to the Lugano Convention and its associated instruments, the Brussels Convention, etc., was the Italian torpedo. Uh, this metaphor of weaponry characterizes perhaps where we are today with regard to accession to Lugano. We are in conflict over conflicts, conflict of laws, that is. For the last 34 years, uh, English lawyers like myself and some of my panelists I have been used to dealing with cross-border disputes across Europe, and I mention across Europe, not just the EU, under a series of conventions and regulations. These became law in the UK under the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Act of 1982. But this did not come into force uh, until 1987. I'm rather pleased, Lewis, that you didn't mention how long I have been in practice, but I am perhaps one of those who has had at least 10 years exper uh, experience of operating pre-Brussels and pre-the CJJA. So I know what it's like from both points of view. The instruments that are concerned are familiar to you all. As Lewis mentioned, we start with the Brussels Convention in 1968, followed by the Lugano Convention in 1988, and the Brussels Regulation of 2001, and of course, Brussels Recast of 2012. The primary purpose of these uh, conventions and, and regulations was to provide a regime which determined which court in which jurisdiction a dispute was to be heard and to provide simplification relating to the reciprocal uh, uh, recognition and enforcement of judgments throughout the regime. It's also worth mentioning the Hague Convention on choice of court uh, agreements of 2005, because this has some bearing on the EU's view of whether the UK should accede to Lugano. The Hague Convention itself sits outside the EU, the European regime. 
So what does Lugano give us? What has it given us? Well, it's provided us with a harmonized approach to determining jurisdiction. There's no need to apply for permission to the English court to serve your proceedings out of, the juris out of this jurisdiction. It avoids arguments about security for costs based on the foreign domicile of the claimant. So there are some significant advantages. But on the other hand, it is a very prescriptive piece of uh, legislation or, 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 or international um, instrument. It's mandatory. There's little room for discretion that we as common lawyers are used to. It's complex. Now, this is maybe a rather trite comparison, but my own copy of Dicey and Morris in 1981, which of course was pre Spiliada, may I say, and prior to the CJJ of the, uh, 1982, ran to some 600 pages. Adrian Briggs's book on the CJJA runs to over 1,100 pages. That gives you some idea of the difference uh, in complexity. The rule that you must serve in the courts of the defendant's domicile can, of course, force you into what I would call undesirable jurisdictions. And that is because of that, that the expression, the Italian torpedo, arose. We have the Texan shoot house and the issue of court first seized. And of course, what we don't have under uh, Lugano is anti-suit injunctions. So there are pros and cons to whether it is a good thing for us to join Lugano and accede to it. From a personal point of view, I didn't find it that difficult to litigate internationally prior to our joining uh, the Brussels Convention and subsequently Lugano. There are, of course, exceptions to uh, the domiciliary rule uh, for suing defendants in the, domicile, the uh, uh, court of their domicile, place of performance being one and place of harm being the other. But the significant exception for this morning's discussion is that of arbitration. But before handing over to my colleague, uh, Philippa Charles on this, I'd just like to mention something about the British point of view on accession. As Lewis mentioned on the 4th of May, the European Union rejected our application to accede to, uh, to um, Lugano. <clears throat> they linked their assessment to membership of the internal, uh, the internal market. But the British government's view is that Lugano is an international agreement open to third parties and not requiring membership of the single market. So that's the exception to Lugano, the arbitration uh, uh, exception. And on that note, I'd like to hand over to Philippa, who is sat in Dublin, as I believe, uh, in part of the EU. So. Let me leave it to you, to Philippa, to deal with the arbitration exception. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you, uh, even from uh, the EU this morning. Um, look, the, the starting point for what I want to talk about, which is the, the West tankers problem, is that UK courts have the power in principle to issue an anti-suit injunction in favour of arbitration, where a party commences for foreign court proceedings in breach of a valid arbitration agreement, and that's pursuant to the Senior Courts Act, Section 37. So whilst this is a feature of the English Courts supervisory jurisdiction, which has been for some users a real positive, there's always been a tension in that the grant of an anti-suit injunction is an indirect interference with the process of a foreign sovereign court. And that concept of comity and the, the allocation of responsibility between member states courts within the structure of the EU came to the fore in the West Tankers case, which, although it's now more than a decade old, it remains a key authority on the approach to be taken by EU member states courts to proceedings brought in an EU member state in breach of an agreement to arbitrate. So for those not old enough to remember the Brussels regulation before it was recast, I thought it might be worth just reminding everyone what the substance of the West Tankers case was, because actually it's quite relevant to how the, the decision panned out. 
So in August of 2000, a vessel owned by West Tankers and chartered by Erg Petroli caused damage when it collided with a jetty owned by Erg in Syracuse in Italy. The charter party was governed by English law and contained a clause providing for arbitration in London. Erg claimed against its own insurers up to the limit of its cover and then began arbitration proceedings in London against West Tankers for the excess and West Tankers disputed liability. Erg's insurers then issued subrogation proceedings in Italy against West Tankers to recover the sums they had paid to Erg. And in response, West Tankers started proceedings in the English High Court for an anti-suit injunction preventing the insurers from continuing the Italian proceedings in breach of the London Arbitration Clause. So in March of 2005, the High Court granted the injunction, but Erg's insurers appealed to the House of Lords, as it then was, and in February 2007, the Law Lords referred the matter to the European Court of Justice. So as Jonathan said, under the original Brussels regulation and indeed under the recast regulation, there is a sort of general principle about the allocation of jurisdiction. And the general rule is that a party who's domiciled in an EU member state can be and should be sued in the courts of their own domicile. But in certain specified situations, courts of the other member states may also have jurisdiction. And so the question of how to resolve the claims of competing jurisdictions has, has had to be resolved. Now, in 2003 and 2004, the CJEU had given two prior de decisions in MIT and Gasser and Turner and Grovit, which established that from the perspective of EU law, it's for the court first seized of a matter to determine whether it should retain or decline jurisdiction, and that it is an abuse for the courts in the party's selected jurisdiction to seek to speed up the process by issuing an anti-suit injunction. And the question in West Tankers was whether the same principle applied in a case where the proceedings were brought in breach of an agreement to arbitrate rather than in breach of a jurisdiction clause or of the domicile or exclusivity provisions of the regulation. So if the charter party in West Tankers had not included the arbitration clause, West Tankers could validly have been sued in the member state where the harm occurred, in this case, Italy. And bearing in mind Jonathan's comment about the Italian torpedo, um, everybody knows that proceedings in Italy can and certainly did at that time take a very long time to reach any sort of resolution. The regulation, however, specifically stated that it, quote, shall not apply, close quotes, to arbitration. So the scope of that exclusion had to be considered. And the question really was whether it only covered the arbitration proceedings themselves or whether it extended to proceedings relating to the arbitration, including proceedings to restrain breaches of the agreement to arbitrate. The view of the House of Lords was that the exclusion covered all disputes which the parties had agreed should be settled by arbitration, including any secondary disputes connected with the arbitration. And that's very much in line with the pro-arbitration philosophy it would present in Fiona Trust and Privilov, I think later the same year. So only the arbitration tribunal and the national court supervising the arbitration had jurisdiction in the House of Lords view to decide on the validity and the scope of an agreement to arbitrate. What the CJEU did, however, was to say that an anti-suit injunction was incompatible with the regulation, even in cases of arbitration. And the question they said, whether or not the regulation applied, depended solely on the subject matter of the proceedings against which the injunction was directed. So the subrogated claim for damages in tort brought by ERG's insurers against West Tankers fell, they said, within its scope. And the application of the arbitration clause was therefore a preliminary issue to be decided by the Italian court. And what the CJEU said was that allowing the English court to circumvent that and grant an anti-suit injunction in those circumstances would necessarily amount to stripping the Italian court of the power to rule on its own jurisdiction, which otherwise exists under the Brussels regulation. Now, I should say, the assumption made by the CJEU in this and other cases is that the court first sees will always do the right thing and decline jurisdiction in favour of the proper court or the arbitration. But from a practical standpoint, the time and the cost of the process of getting that court to the point of making the right decision can be very substantial. So what, you may ask, does all this ancient history have to do with Lugano? Well, after West Tankers, the EU replaced Brussels regulation with the Brussels One recast in 2015. 
And the recast regulation much more expressly carved out arbitration from the scope of the regulation. In fact, to such an extent that in the Gazprom case in 2014, Advocate General Watale held that if West Tankers had been decided under Brussels 1 recast, anti-suit injunctions would not have been held to be incompatible with the regulation, because in his view, the arbitration exception excluded ancillary proceedings, including anti-suit injunctions. And that stance is quite interesting because I think it indicates there's a possibility in the future of a departure from the West Tankers uh, ruling under the Brussels One recast, but that hasn't happened so far. But what it does mean is that if the UK were to accede to Lugano, the position would be equivalent to that which was the case under the original terms of the Brussels regulation, and the, therefore the potentially ambiguous scope of the generalised arbitration exclusion, i.e. the wording that it says it simply shall not apply to arbitration. So the English courts might continue to be constrained by West Tankers in future cases involving proceedings in Lugano signatory states from granting anti-suit relief at least pending a decision along the lines of the Watale opinion in Gazprom being adopted by the CJEU. So for the purposes of protecting rights to arbitrate in London, not acceding to Lugano might give the English courts the ability to use their pro-arbitration stance with teeth in those cases. And I think it's worth noting here that although a lot of the focus in commentary on the decision in Enka and Chubb in the Supreme Court last year was on the aspects which dealt with the test for establishing the governing law of the agreement to arbitrate, the case also concerned anti-suit relief in relation to arbitration proceedings. And the judgment of uh, Lord Justice Popplewell in the Court of Appeal in that case focuses very strongly on the power to grant anti-suit relief as a significant component of the supervisory jurisdiction of the court of the seat. So where the seat is in England, that power could be exercised by the courts once outside of the constraint of EU and Lugano membership, even in cases involving EU and Lugano member states courts. So from the perspective of an arbitration practitioner, there may even be positive reasons to prefer remaining outside the scope of Lugano and having the benefit of the anti-suit injunction regime without restriction. Now, in late breaking news, Mrs. Justice Cockrell gave a very interesting speech yesterday at the Dispute Resolution Forum, which I had the opportunity to read this morning, and which is well worth a review more generally. But specifically, um, I wanted to note her discussion in relation to the position of English court jurisdiction after Brexit, from which I have extracted a few quotes which are relevant to the, the topic we're discussing today. And she said this, Brexit and COVID are making people think as never before about why they litigate here. We knew this was coming with Brexit. Our being outside Europe was always going to raise questions about whether we were any longer the go-to jurisdiction. She went on to say that some people who happily previously accepted an exclusive jurisdiction clause for English courts or English seated arbitrations now feel more comfortable at home. And then she says that in the commercial court, they've seen an unprecedented number of anti-suit injunctions so far this year. Now, she doesn't have the specific statistical breakdown between injunctions in general and anti-suits in particular. But what she can say is that at the end of April, there had already been 29 on notice injunctions and 46 without notice in the 2021-22 year. And she says that's considerably up on the number of injunctions which the court has seen in previous years. It's higher than the full year figures for each of the three previous years. And the perception of the judges of the court, she says, is that it's been heavily skewed to anti-suit injunctions. Now, she does go on to clarify that these are not Brexit related or West Tankers type anti-suit injunctions that hasn't arisen yet. They're global in nature. But what they seem to be, she says, is apparently clear breaches of exclusive jurisdiction clauses. And she says, for now, we can hold the line with anti-suits, but it perhaps suggests that people may think more in the future about such clauses, i.e. exclusive jurisdiction clauses in favour of London. What the recent cases seem to show, I think, is a trend that parties which had committed to London-based proceedings are perhaps opting to try to move away from that choice. And the English courts are seeking to protect those previous elections as far as possible using their anti-suit jurisdiction. So while membership of Lugano might provide a degree of certainty about jurisdictional choice, and I, and I do think that's important and I'm sure we'll come on to it in the discussion, 
If part of what makes England attractive as a destination for dispute resolution is the ability of the courts to protect parties' choice by way of anti-suit relief, then a future outside of Lugano may prove to be beneficial rather than damaging, but this will depend on party willingness to continue to come to London in the first place. Lewis, back to you. Thank you very much, Philippa. And um, that, 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 that was, and thank you, Jonathan, as well. That was a really illuminating start. I think we're, uh, we're off to, um, uh, to an interesting discussion. I also want to thank um, the audience members for letting us know where you're all coming from. I think it's an indication of, um, of, of the, the, the extent of interest in, in the questions being raised here today, that we've got a truly international audience. Uh, we've got people joining us from Ankara, Singapore, um, Beijing, Nigeria, and indeed Tehran. Uh, so thank you all for joining and please do keep your, your questions coming in the, the Q&A, we will we'll get to those. Um, Stuart, I wanted to bring you in here just to, to follow up on uh, some of those points that, that Philippa and Jonathan were making. And if you could speak uh, particularly about your own experience of enforcing under Lugano and what you, uh, what you anticipate as being the, the change reality uh, in 2021 and beyond. Thanks very much, Lewis. And as you say, I'll, I'll speak briefly about enforcing under the Lugano Convention, which is the convention which the UK is trying to accede to. Uh, the alternative, which is newly available, which is the Hague uh, Choice of Courts Agreement, which is a 2005 Hague Convention Agreement. And actually, if you don't mind, I'll kick back to uh, some other panellists. I know they also have some views in relation to enforcement under Lugano and perhaps also on um, the, uh, the alternative, which is the Hague Convention. But uh, as, as uh, Jonathan Wood was talking about at the start, what we currently have available to us uh, 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 as a possibility is getting under the, the Lugano Convention. And the Lugano Convention was a convention which was uh, agreed in 2007 to sit alongside what was in the Brussels Convention. The Brussels Convention of 1968 was an agreement between the EU states providing for ease of enforcement of judgments throughout the EU. We had the EFTA states or the EEA states, which were principally Iceland, Switzerland and Norway, we wanted to bring them into that regime. So the EU agreed with those states. So at that point, negotiating on behalf of the UK to have another convention, which basically mirrored the Brussels Convention. Now that was in 2007. As we all know, the Brussels Convention of 68 was updated to be the Brussels regulation. And then more recently, the Brussels recast in 2015. Uh, significantly and, and significantly for a point that uh, was just made by Philippa, the Lugano Convention was not updated. It remained as it was, it's set in aspic uh, in the state it was for the Brussels Convention. So um, as you heard earlier, um, Philippa was making a point that as a result of that, it may have an impact in relation to uh, jurisprudence on anti-suit injunctions. But uh, I, I was fortunate enough um, to uh, enforce continental judgments, so judgments from um, continental Europe in the UK under the Lugano Convention and to enforce UK judgments in, uh, in EFTA states, principally Switzerland under Lugano. And uh, my observation was that um, the, as Jonathan says, the Lugano Convention was very prescriptive, but within those prescriptions, it provided a very predictable, quick and easy means of enforcing the judgments of EFTA states. So uh, Iceland, uh, Norway, Switzerland in the UK. Yeah. And I've seen it time and time again that they were enforced with relevant ease under that convention. Now, conversely, I also was enforcing on a number of occasions UK English judgments principally in EFTA states. And again, that was principally in Iceland in relation to the financial crisis and also Switzerland because of its general nature of its, uh, its banking practice. And I found in those countries, it was a little bit more difficult to enforce uh, a judgment, an English judgment under Lugano than it was the other way around to bring those continental judgments into, into the UK. Now, um, we, we, um, we, we've talked about an alternative which is going to be available, which is available, and that is the, the Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements. And that's a 2005 Hague Convention Agreement. Now that's a convention that says that if you have a choice of court agreement in your contract, then any judgment rendered under shall be enforced by the parties to the Hague Convention. And those parties include the EU and the UK. Now, uh, that convention therefore allows for the enforcement of judgments rendered by the UK courts pursuant to a choice of court agreement throughout the EU. Now, it, it is not, unfortunately, it is not as favourable as what we had prior to leaving the EU. And, it's, and it is unfortunately in some ways not as favourable as what you would get under the Lugano Convention. Principally, it only covers exclusive 
jurisdiction agreements. It does not cover non-exclusive jurisdiction agreements. So if, if the option is given of suing in the English courts or elsewhere, it will not apply. It will not apply to asymmetric jurisdiction clauses. And we've all seen, particularly in contracts with banks, uh, one party is given the benefit of the jurisdiction clause, so it can choose to sue elsewhere if it wants to, but the other counterparty has no choice, it must sue in the, in the courts of England, say. Those clauses will not be covered by the Hague Convention. Similarly, another clause we're seeing more is the, the optional clause that allows uh, one party to choose uh, arbitration or litigation. It can kick off in either forum. Even if the litigation option is described as being exclusive, again, the Hague Convention will not apply to that judgment. So if you choose to go down the litigation route, you can't end up using the Hague Convention to enforce any, any uh, judgment of that case. Another, another limitation with the Hague Convention is it does not apply to enforcing interim relief, interim protective measures. That's distinct from Lugano, and that's distinct from the Brussels regulation we used to enjoy. So in many cases, what is as important, if not more important than a final judgment, is obtaining interim protective relief, particularly, for example, in measures where you're, where you're uh, trying to protect your IP rights, your trademark rights. You want to get into court very, very quickly and get a, a judgment or get an order on an interim basis that will hold the ring pending the final relief, because if they continue using your IP right, for example, it will destroy the value in the right by the time you eventually, a year down the track or nine months down the track, get to a final judgment. So it can be crucial. And unfortunately, under the Hague Convention, they are not protected. Um, the, um, the law outside of the Hague, now there, there is another slight problem with the Hague Convention, and that is that there's a lacuna. It, uh, it, the e UK left the EU on the 31st of January 2020. However, as far as the EU is concerned, the UK did not join uh, the Hague Convention except in relation to agreements entered into after the 1st of January this year. So we have a 12 month lacuna there where there is no coverage. Now, um, another problem with the Hague Convention, and you forgive me if I go through problems rather than solutions, but another problem is that the methods for enforcing a judgment under the Hague Convention have not yet been determined by local courts. So there's no specific provisions or law on how you use the Hague Convention in their courts. They've signed up to the convention, but they haven't set out how it's employed. And I can tell you that outside, outside the Hague Convention, general law on the enforcement of uh, foreign judgments in some European countries can be very problematic. It can take a very, very long time to enforce a foreign judgment in some countries, including some you might not suspect. So including countries such as uh, France, Germany, Italy may not be a surprise to some, but in addition, there are very significant problems enforcing foreign judgments in some of the Nordic countries, especially Denmark, Denmark and Finland. And so with that, uh, and my, uh, I will just mention one final thing, which is the Hague Convention has also published a 2019 general Hague Convention on the enforcement of judgments, which applies not just to judgments rendered under contracts which have a choice of court agreement, but, and that would apply, it, it's not dissimilar to the Brussels reg, so it's quite expansive. The problem is that there are only three signatories, uh, and I think at last look, um, it was, yes, Israel, Ukraine, and Uruguay. And um, the problem with the Hague General Conventions is the US. Nobody wants to sign up to a convention where you can enforce a US judgment. So with that, can I ask, um, Jonathan, I, I know you've got some interesting observations on enforcement under the Lugano Convention. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, just a general observation. I think it's very interesting that um, there's a slight obsession with uh, joining the uh, Lugano Convention. And I always remark on the fact that uh, probably one of our biggest trade partners is the USA. And we've never had any form of treaty or convention with the USA so far as reciprocal enforcement of judgments is concerned. And we've managed to live quite happily with that. And of course we have got protection against uh, the sort of punitive damages element uh, uh, in relation to some of their judgments uh, being enforced over here. So, you know, we've lived without a convention with our biggest trading partner uh, in the USA. Um, I think the other thing to say about uh, just touching on the Hague Convention, of course, one of the benefits uh, that I mentioned about, about Lugano was, of course, you don't need permission to serve out from the English court. And I think that's the same with regard to the Hague Convention as well. So you don't have the cost associated with that. 
But in my own experience, and um, which is borne out by having acted for uh, the British Exports uh, uh, Guarantee Department, ECGD, who provided credit insurance to British exporters and for the um, international credit insurers generally, um, we, have found, we did some research some years ago, I hasten to add, um, and in broad terms, we found that um, enforcing judgments, if I dare say it, in the Northern European countries uh, was much easier than, should I say, in Southern uh, Europe and the further east you went. Uh, so, you know, I think you have to be uh, careful as to which jurisdiction, you know, you have to look at it. What we also found were two other things. Firstly, as far as arbitration was concerned, um, whilst we do have the benefit of the New York Convention, and I think that's you know, the big plus of arbitration is uh, enforcement of uh, awards under the New York Convention. You, the problem is that um, when you're collecting receivables, uh, arbitration isn't the speediest way of going about that. And um, now that's changed somewhat as many of the institutions have brought in summary judgment type of uh, rules. Uh, but we also found that um, it was easier to bring proceedings in the court of the domicile, so far as collections were concerned in the Northern European uh, arena. And so there were very mixed views as to the efficacy of enforcing under Lugano. And I found it quite expensive too. I found that one had to go to overseas lawyers in those jurisdictions. There was a lack of understanding uh, with the local judiciary and it was not a cheap process. So whilst it was designed as uh, a simplification in practice, I didn't find that it was such a simplification after all. Thank, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Stuart. Uh, we've got some excellent questions coming in here about um, enforceability in, in, in specific um, circumstances as well. But just before we come to those, I did want to bring in Eric at this point, um, specifically to talk about some of the, the, the politics of this issue. Obviously, um, Lugano and the UK's application to, to, to reaccede re um, is very much bound up with the wider question of, of Brexit and perceptions of what that means uh, on both sides of the channel. So, Eric, could you um, perhaps give the, the view from Brussels about what the um, the prospects for reaccession might be and, and how that dynamic is being viewed um, from, from the European perspective. Thank you, Lewis, and very pleased to be here. Um, greetings to everybody. Um, yes, a, a quick view from Brussels about um, accession to the Lugano Convention by the UK. Um, it does require approval of all the contracting parties. Um, most of them have already said Yes, um, the EU is a contracting party and it has not said yes. Um, the Commission ha has issued a communication saying that it doesn't think that the UK should be allowed to join Lugano um, because it considers Lugano to be a flanking measure to the internal market and that um, the UK has chosen to leave the internal market. So there, you're not allowed to join. Um, this is just a communication to the council, and of course it's the council who ultimately decides. Um, it would need a qualified majority in the council, um, which is, um, um, I think, 15 out of the 27 member states. Um, but it's not come anywhere close to a vote yet. Um, apparently, Germany is in favour, but France is against. And, you know, the motto of the European Union is France and Germany. And uh, when they agree, things happen. When they don't agree, things don't. Um, so it's not got very far in the council. In fact, in order to decide, um, the council would require a proposal from the commission. And the commission has not sent a proposal. It simply, simply sent a re recommendation um, saying what it thinks. And um, maybe the discussion will just not ever get anywhere and there will be a proposal. The, um, as I said, there's some strong opposition, in particular from the Commission, and that, that is important because it's the Commission that needs to make the proposal, and it can delay. Um, so please don't hold your breath uh, for, EU, uh, for the UK to join Lugano. 
And uh, well, that's just one of the consequences of Brexit. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Eric. Um, I, I think the, um, the, the, the different dynamics across the EU member states is a very interesting one as well and does tap into that wider question of what Brexit means for the relative attractiveness of, um, of different centres of, of dispute resolution. I know uh, only in February the, the French uh, Justice Minister was talking about the, um, the opportunity provided by, by Brexit um, for, uh, for, for France to take some of, um, some of London's share of, uh, of the market in, in dispute resolution. And uh, we know that those kinds of perceptions are, uh, play, play an important role. Um, I wanted just to, to hand back to, uh, to the other panelists as well, just to see what, uh, what, what your views are on that. And particularly perhaps in, um, not only between the UK and the EU, but in terms of the wider global landscape of dispute resolution, we've recently had the, the White and Case survey. Um, where do you see Lugano and Brexit fitting into some of those wider questions about um, the, the, the increase in competition between different seats? Shall I um, start with this? Um, Queen Mary has become, uh, you know, sort of almost the Bible. Uh, in relation to establishing uh, a league table as to uh, you know which is the most favourable jurisdiction in which to uh, arbitrate, I think um, you know we see headlines that uh, Singapore has risen up the ladder, uh, uh, perhaps ahead of Paris. Was I think the lawyer reported this recently, but I think. Um, point always needs to be made about the Queen Mary is that it's very much based, it's the analysis very much based on the institutional arbitrations that are going on in a particular jurisdiction, uh, rather than taking account of, for example, ad hoc or arbitrations, for example, which are being run by the London Maritime Arbitration Association and all the commodity um, uh, institutions, GAFTA, FOSFA, the LME, uh, the Cotton Exchange up in Liverpool and the like. And just looking at the uh, statistics for the LMAA, the London Maritime Arbitration Association, I mean, they uh, eclipse the numbers that are being dealt with by the ICC, the LCIA and Singapore. So, you know, you have to look at Queen Mary uh, in a bit of context from that point of view. And it doesn't, as I say, it doesn't really take account of the huge number of ad hoc arbitrations that take place in uh, in England at any one time. So you know that's that that's the way I would see uh, Queen Mary um, sort of reflecting on the status of the UK or London in particular as a venue and a seat for international arbitration. Philip, I, I don't know what you think about this uh, and, and Queen Mary. I mean, I I agree with you, Jonathan. I think you know. Obviously, the Queen Mary survey, to a degree, is self-selecting, um, and and as you say, it, it focuses quite strongly on the sort of institutional arbitration dynamic. I suppose, in a way, it's slightly a kind of bubble view um, from within the arbitration community about how arbitration is working and where it's working well. Um, I think what's perhaps more interesting and more of a challenge is the kind of the perception of the business community about the situation in London now um, and, and how attractive London now is for them as a, as a venue for their dispute resolution processes. And it just seems to me that, you know, uncertainty, as we have now in relation to the question of whether there'll be an accession to Lugano, is inevitably damaging to London's standing within the user community because there's a lack of certainty about what the outcomes are gonna look like or how enforceable an outcome is going to be. Albeit that I think from the arbitration perspective, we're you know, comforted and consoled, I think to, to a very large degree by the existence of the New York Convention and the, the relative ease of that process. But I think if we're looking at London as a dispute resolution hub in the wider context, Clearly, you know, the sooner we can get some certainty about what is and is not going to be possible going forward is, is going to be really important. But, um, but Stuart, I think you had some thoughts about kind of client preferences and, and whether actually the, the jurisdictional aspect is as important as the, the law. Exactly. And in fact, if I just take one of your points, you were just mentioned at the end there, Philippa, that lack of access to Lugano 
I think must is undoubtedly in our clients' eyes a, a cause for concern. How much concern is another matter, but definitely a cause for concern. I'd even take a step back from that. The lack of access to Brussels is an even bigger cause of concern. Now, we've got lack of access to Brussels. Lugano is, is, a, is a, an ersatz Brussels. Uh, we've got lack of access to that as well. They're both, they're both problematic, certainly from the point of view of litigation in London and litigation in the UK. But I think what, what you're referring to, Philippa, is of course, the reason, the main reason as we see it as practitioners, that London is the center it is, is because of that, that wonderful thing, which is not changing which is access to English law. English law, um, uh, for good, bad, or otherwise, uh, is the lingua franca of international trade, international commerce. It is, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm an Australian lawyer, so I can say this with a little bit of dispassion, um, that it's, it's, it is for good reason. It's, it's eminently predictable, it's eminently certain, it's written in one of the most easily accessible languages in the world, English. It's based on precedent, on stare decisis, so if you want to know what the law is, you find the most recent case uh, of the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court on an issue and you read it. And one obligation of the judges in, in a common law case is to set out what the law is and then explain how it applies to the facts of their case. So you've got this wonderful source of the law in English law, which we should, uh, which, which, which English lawyers have successfully sold around the world uh, for, for hundreds of years. And it's a source of law which we should be very, very proud of. And in fact, I would argue that leaving the EU uh, has in fact strengthened English law. Um, one of the things that we've seen happening in relation to English law as part of the EU is some civil law principles coming in, whether it's by way of sort of percolating um, through uh, the, 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 the closer interaction with European law, or whether it's through coming in by way of uh, uh, conventions and regulations. So things like the Brussels regulation, things like the, the Rome regulation have provisions in them that uh, deal with what law applies in certain situations and how something should be dealt with, which is an amalgam of common law and civil law. And when we step back from those, we step back to what is a much more positivist, predictable and certain system, which is English law. And you ally that, perhaps happily, some would say, with a much more positivist Supreme Court, a Supreme Court which is perhaps uh, being led by the Jonathan Sumptions of the world to be much more positivist and, and sadly for, for at least one former South African judge, uh, abandoning the Hoffman-esque view of how you interpret contracts and bring it back to a much more certain, much more positivist way of interpreting and applying um, contract law. And by the way, as an Australian lawyer, this is what we would call a Dixonian view of the interpretation of contracts, which is what was uh, operating in Australia in the 1960s under Chief Justice Dixon. But all of these things mean that English law is much more accessible much more attractive to international commerce, much more predictable. And therefore I see it uh, remaining the hallmark of dispute resolution in the UK. People will remain attracted to the UK as a forum because of English law and the expertise that resides on this aisle in relation to it. Well, I agree thoroughly with that, Stuart. Um, I'm a great proponent of the English law. And I think it's a matter of great flattery that when you read about what's going on in continental Europe, uh, they're purporting to try cases in their courts on English law. So, mm. um, but would you really want a French judge, uh, dare I ask, uh, to uh, opine upon English law? Uh, that raises an interesting question. But uh, English law has, uh, you know, as you say, has been adopted around the world, in Abu Dhabi, uh, and Dubai, in Kazakhstan, places like this, all adopting the English common law. And I think that is a great uh, credit to our system of law. And uh, there is an argument, and if anyone reads uh, something like the, Daily, uh, the Sunday Telegraph, there was a very interesting article uh, by uh, Barney Reynolds of Sherman and Sterling saying that um, the English common law uh, represents the best way to support the financial services market. And if we move to the civil law, that would represent a systemic risk to the financial services market. So English law has a great deal to commend it. And I think that is our great sell going forward. Uh, how that is undertaken, whether that will affect dispute resolution in the UK remains to be seen. Philippa, have you got a view? You've probably given it. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I think I have, and, and yeah. you know, like I do think it's an advantage, but, um, but you know, I think it, 
what what will determine how successful all of this is i think is how well we bed in the future relationship with europe and how well that is presented to the business community as a stable structure within which to work um, and also for the benefit of consumers and individuals as well you know that's been a really important aspect for them and i think it's something that we can lose sight of in the discussion about commercial dispute resolution so how the new framework works between the UK and the EU I think within that you know whether English law will continue to be a a desirable thing um, I think will will depend on on the implementation. Mm -hmm. And and I think we were talking uh, as we came on the call uh, Philippa, Jonathan and I about uh, what we're seeing our clients doing and I I noted that I uh, at at my firm we we act for a number of the on, on a number of financial transactions where we see European institutions on the other side and where in the past they would have said very, we were very happy. In fact, we want English law, um, and they would have been uh, uh, prepared to accept uh, uh, London courts for dispute resolution. They're now saying no. We, we see we have to go for English law, and they kind of see that they they say we're stuck with it because it's the only law that works for this transaction. Um, but we're not prepared to accept English courts anymore because you've left the club. So we're seeing English law with uh, a Paris seated arbitration, uh, and we're seeing exploration of this this concept that. Jonathan rightly noted a moment ago, which is continental courts applying English law and how that works, because they, they see the value in English law. And I should add, it isn't just the predictability of English law. English law can do things that some law systems cannot do. English law has co- is able to accommodate concepts of subordination, escrow, other complex financial products and, and uh, financial ideas, which simply find no basis in many civil laws. In fact, uh, Russia is constantly threatening to change its its uh, civil law system in many ways to replicate common law because Russian law simply cannot accommodate the kind of complex financial structures needed uh, and which can be created under English law. So I'm um, increasingly seeing that and um, going back to a point you made earlier, um, um, uh, Philippa, about people moving away from English courts and there being a risk of that, we're certainly seeing it in practice, but thankfully, given the point that you, you and Jonathan made earlier about um, the New York Convention, we're seeing arbitration being the uh, often a preferred mechanism in choice or instead of the English courts. Th- thank you, everybody. I, I think that's an ideal point in which to switch to the, uh, the perhaps the wider lens question of the impact of Brexit and the TCA on legal services and um, and, and arbitration in particular. And um, I wondered, Eric, if you could um, if you could start that discussion off. Um, just with your assessment of, uh, of of what Brexit and the TCA specifically means, and just for for the audience members, thank you. Keep keep the questions coming in. We will get to uh, as many as as we possibly can uh, later in the session. Eric, thank you, Lewis. Yes, this is a slightly different subject. Um, what actually does the TCA say about provision of arbitration services? Well, I think. Um, and you know, as, we, as has been clear from the earlier discussion, Brexit is going to have an impact on arbitration in many ways. Um, quite what the TCA says about provision of arbitration services is uh, another issue. One needs to, reading the TCA as it applies to services is not easy um, because it follows the kind of structure you see in the in the, in the GATS agreement and um, in some bilateral uh, free trade agreements of the EU, where there's a general principle, um, which is fine, but then there are lots of exceptions and reservations and uh, very often member state specific, which are listed in the annexes. And they're written by different people. It's not clear quite how um, they all fit together. But It also, another feature is that the distinctions are made between the cross-border provision of services, that is over over Zoom, if you like, uh, but also by correspondence more traditionally, or um, people coming to see you in your office, but where one part of this service is situated in one country and the other part is situated in another. Uh, or the service to receiver is situated in another. Uh, this is cross-border supply. And their um, principle is freedom, uh, but with lots of exceptions listed in annexes. It's a negative list approach, is what it's, it's according to the jargon. It means that you need to look to see if there's an exception. 
for um, provision of services through the movement of people as temporary presence in, a, in another jurisdiction. It's more complex in that um, it takes a, a slightly different approach, positive a list approach. Um, the freedom has to be given by the agreement. It's not uh, just look for the exception. You have to positively be able to establish possibility to provide the service in the agreement. So I mean, this is often called fly in, fly out, um, but the, the agreement distinguishes between different kinds. There's short-term business visitors, and there's a contractual service supply, and there's independent professionals are likely to be relevant here. I mean, it's all very different. For example, short-term business visits are allowed for 90 days in any six months period. Um, and for contractual service supply and independent professionals, you can come for longer. But for independent uh, professionals, for example, you must first of all have six years professional experience before you can qualify for providing the service within the terms of the um, agreement. There's also in the uh, TCA, a separate um, section, section seven of chapter five of the services part. So it's all very much divided up, um, which is uh, about the regulatory framework. And so it sets out a few regulatory principles to apply. But okay, so it's a complex um, situation. Uh, so I think you need to establish whether a service can be provided in principle. Secondly, whether there is an exception, a reservation. And then another matter is, these are just reservations of permitted restrictions. It doesn't mean to say that the restriction will be applied. So you need to also establish whether the country actually uh, applies the restrictions which is allowed to apply. And then, of course, one needs to look to see about um, licensing and qualification requirements. Can you give advice on local law or just on your own law, um, on EU law or international law? I'll come to this in a second. But I think um, as arbitrators, you're interested in two services. And here, again, there's a distinction. There's arbitration itself. that is acting as an arbitrator. And then there's what's termed legal arbitration services, which is defined in the agreement uh, as, as being the preparation of documents or the appearance before lawyers. So this is what um, legal advisors do in an arbitration. And these are dealt with differently. So the service of arbitration itself, acting as an arbitrator, is not addressed in the TCA. So it's only the general principles that apply. Um, there's a lot said, however, about the, about the provision of legal arbitration services, that is, acting for a party, preparing its documents and appearing for it. Now, on, let's, let's first of all consider cross-border provision. So um, you are writing documents uh, for submission to an arbitration, which has its seat somewhere in the EU, um, for a client in the EU, um, what, is, what are the restrictions applicable there? Well, it's often assumed that not very much, and in practice it's true, that not many restrictions are actually applied. Um, but if you look at details in reservation number two to annex 19 to the TCA, you see that there are a series of, um, of limitations that are listed. So. Hungary, for example, seems to clearly prohibit cross-border supply of legal arbitration services. Cyprus and the Czech Republic impose residency requirements, which of course, if applied, uh, effectively prevent provision of the service cross-border. Um, Spain and Portugal require a professional address, which is less than residency. You just have to have a friend who's a lawyer who will forward mail to you. Um, and um, Slovakia and Slovenia say that they require reciprocity, which probably in the case of the UK is not a problem, um, but it is there. And of course, as I said, because it's cross-border and it's difficult to actually enforce these restrictions, you know, how is um, Hungary going to stop a, a, a UK a, a lawyer in London from providing services um, if, he doesn't come to, if he doesn't come to Hungary? 
the next issue then is um, cross borders uh, is is movement of is temporary presence. So I think if the temporary presence is fair to say that there are additional restrictions. I mean, coming into a territory is something which countries regulate more. The purpose of which you can come it requires work, work visas, for example. So Austria appears to prohibit it. Um, a saying it says expressly that um, legal services on foreign and international law can only be provided cross border. So you're not allowed to come in practice. And um, so Germany and France reserved the practice of legal services to members of their bars. Okay. Um, quite how much they apply that is another matter. Bulgaria, Estonia, Greece, Hungary, Latvia, Malta uh, have residence or nas even nationality requirements. And they reserve it to EEA, um, EEA residents or Swiss residents or EEA nationals in some cases. And so this would prevent the provision of services through temporary presence for UK established lawyers. Others do allow for exceptions to be granted. Of course, you need to see that the exception is granted. Portugal and Spain does that, for example. So having got over that, those hurdles, you know, can this service be provided? Uh, can the member state impose a restriction? There's then the often quoted um, dedicated section on regulated services. Um, that though contains a wrinkle because the definition of legal, legal um, arbitration services seems to apply, uh, seems, seems to exclude the provision of services through temporary presence. So uh, that whole section, which is said to liberalize provision of legal services, would only apply to cross-border provision, if that's correct, and not to presence through local presence, not to uh, provision through local presence. So the situation is not as liberal as it might appear at first sight and looking at the agreement. But it's not really safe to just rely on the, the agreement because it, for each of the countries concerned, there's a reference to the national law concern. So it says, you know, restrictions in my national law will continue to apply. Right? So you need to see exactly what that national law says. And again, uh, these are possibilities. They don't, these restrictions don't actually have to be applied. Now, as Lewis mentioned at the beginning, and the Law Society is actually doing a study on the restrictions on the provision of of the practice of law after Brexit as it results from the TCA. I mean, uh, one, um, one reflection of the fact that it's, it's rather, it's not as simple as it appears, is the fact that this is still work in progress. I mean, it's not done yet. I've seen a draft, I've seen some of the, some of the um, things that are said, but um, in many cases, they say they're still verifying. So, can I, you know, can I draw some conclusions out of this um, not very clear situation? Um, so first, they do, there, there don't seem to be any, any restrictions expressly um, provided on the provision of arbitration services, that is acting as an arbitrator. Um, and clearly, and you know, some countries are more welcoming than others for that. And yeah, for legal arbitration services, it's acting as a lawyer in an arbitration. Um, there are fewer, there are fewer restrictions when the subject matter of the arbitration relates to non-domestic and international law. So, if the arbitration is about U, uh, is governed by UK law and international law, it's more often possible um, for a lawyer to, from the UK to act. Uh, there they allow, the rule is to allow practice under your national treatment, uh, under your national title. However, the agreement does make clear that EU law is not international law. It is part of the domestic law of EU lawyers, but it's not part of the domestic law of, e, of, of UK lawyers. So UK lawyers are not allowed to, um, to, to give advice on EU law. Third conclusion is that the practice, um, judging from what the Law Society is saying, is much more liberal than the reservations 
indicate. Um, and cross-border provision, fly in, fly out, apparently um, happens a lot. US lawyers coming in and giving arbitration services. And so some countries say, well, actually, you're not allowed UK lawyer to come in here and provide your services. And it's pointed out, well, US lawyers are doing it all the time. So please let me in as well. Um, and that's one of the things the law society is trying to get to grips with, the, the conflict between uh, what the law appears to say and what happens in practice. So there's considerable uncertainty. Um, and you know, the way in which countries um, apply their law is, is also likely to change as they come to grips with the um, change of status of uh, UK lawyers in the EU. Um, and uh, so I mean, all one can say is be careful, um, make sure that the arbitration is being conducted in the country without these, with, 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 without restrictions rather than the country which does have restrictions. It would be very sad to see um, lawyers being arrested at the airport and being let off uh, after a tip off from the other side saying, um, you're not allowed to come here and provide services for your client. This arbitration is going to happen tomorrow. So caution is, is advised. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I think that's an excellent exposition of the, uh, the situation under the TCA and indeed some of the uncertainties uh, around that uh, situation. Um, I know there are different views around the panel on um, what this might mean in practice, and I, and I, I know we won't be able to give a comprehensive picture, but I wondered um, if we could start with Philippa just on um, how you see um, some of this operating and some of the obstacles that we may, uh, that, that the practitioners may hit in different countries of the EU. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's really interesting because, you know, from what Eric's been discussing, there's a distinction between, as he says, what the TCA says and what's happening in practice at the moment. And I think, you know, the reality is that up till now, I think people have had a fairly laissez-faire attitude in, you know, within Europe to, you know, people crossing borders and providing these services. But, you know, we have experience in other jurisdictions of the need for powers of attorney to be properly signed and executed and registered and so on. So to prove that a, a party is properly represented. And I guess the concern that we have, and I know Stuart and I have discussed it, is that from a practitioner perspective, the lack of certainty about implementation of, of these restrictions might indeed lead to a situation in which someone's arrested at an airport because from a tactical strategic you know conduct of litigation perspective you know if we see that there is an advantage to be gained by raising an issue around the the permissibility of representation then we may do so and i think the the other aspect that it seems to me might might later arise is in the, the field of challenges to enforceability of awards because you know there may be a situation in which someone runs as a public policy argument the idea that an award shouldn't be enforced because the party wasn't correctly represented or there was something you know unlawful about the way in which the the proceedings were conducted in that respect now look i think that's probably a long shot but in terms of the you know the lived experience of parties going through arbitration proceedings and enforcement proceedings for potentially years on end, a party that doesn't want to pay is going to take every point available to it um, to delay, divert and seek to upend uh, an award, you know, a, a process that's going to go against it or an award that has gone against it. Um, and so that, I think, is, is you know, where the, the difficulty lies for us as practitioners um, in terms of just making sure that, you know, we dot every I and cross every T whether or not there's a sort of nod and a wink approach in reality at the moment, um, you know, if the law says something different, then you know we we may be at risk. Indeed, I, I think um, ambiguity is uh, is is ripe for for challenge in 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 many of these cases. Um, Stuart and Jonathan, um, did you have any anything that you wanted to to add to those points? I believe you're muted, Stuart. Sorry, as I, I think I mentioned at the outset, I, I'm, I hail from Australia. And in Australia, we have um, a tactic which is quaintly called buggerization. And I think it's what Philippa was referring to. It's where we will 
in, in an arbitration, as Philippa mentions, if you're on the losing side, if you're on the side that is, uh, is going down, uh, uh, you will almost inevitably have instruction from your client to do whatever you can to try and prevent that happening. And if you can take a point, for example, this party shouldn't be presenting this case before you, the arbitrators, you'll take that point. You'll take it in the arbitration. You'll take it on enforcement. And whilst, apart from perhaps my good friend, Louis Flannery, I probably wouldn't call the police to get someone arrested at the airport, apart from his case. Um, I, I think um, you'll be using most of the tactics you can employ to try and, again, buggerize a case, make it more difficult for the party to succeed, make it more difficult for the arbitrators to decide in their favor. And this is a really acute problem, particularly with um, the points that Eric was making. Now, as Eric said, generally in relation to home state law, and public international law, we're okay to practice arbitration subject to some restrictions in most of the significant seats. Um, and in fact, the only seats, and we, I've had to do this because I've got a couple of cases coming up on the continent, the only seats that are causing us major concern at the moment are Austria and Italy in relation to UK lawyers going across and practicing, but there are still concerns in some of the others, but certainly the bigger ones, the Netherlands, France, Germany, uh, we, we feel relatively comfortable going across and practicing UK law and public international law. But even then, what happens if suddenly a point of local law somehow comes up? Do I have to leave the room? Um, do I have to stop instantly, call up local council, bring them in? It's one thing if it's expected. It's another thing if it's unexpected. And also, what about that, uh, that unique uh, 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 juncture of EU law and pill? And of course, uh, we're all council, well, many of us are council in, in, in judgments or BIT cases arising out of Act Mayor, where it's an issue of public international law with an interface with EU law. And of course, in a funny way, the argument is who cares about EU law? It's irrelevant, move on for if you're acting for the claimant. And if you're acting for the respondent, you're saying, no, 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 bring all that EU law in and you can't continue. So uh, in that situation, what, what happens? Um, and again, if you're doing buggerization, if you're looking for means to, to help your client, you'll be saying, hey, uh, Dutson, you need to leave the room now because you're UK qualified. We, you can't be talking about EU law. You can't be talking about this small aspect of local law that's come up in this arbitration. So it's a significant factor. And the ACMEA, um, the ACMEA judgment and its impact on investment treaty arbitration, its impact on energy charter treaty arbitration, it's continuing. It continues to this very day. And that, that's a, a significant problem in relation to UK lawyers taking arbitrations situated on the continent. Uh, and um, um, it's, it's something I, I just, I don't quite know what the answer is at the moment. Well, from an English point of view, and, and may I just say, I think the arbitration community called it guerrilla tactics. Um, but <laughs> but um, I, I mean, this is, a, this is an issue that you encounter in the USA. I mean, I've done a reasonable amount of litigation over in the USA. I've been admitted uh, pro hac vice in various uh, jurisdictions over there. But they do take that point over in the States. And um, I personally can uh, say that I once... Uh, entered the USA and was held and questioned at immigration as to what I was doing. And when I said that I'm here to conduct an arbitration, uh, they wanted to know about the subject matter, which says, well, you can't because it's confidential. But it was a very uncomfortable half an hour uh, where they asked me to go and sit in a room uh, and um, before they came and uh, allowed me through immigration. So it's an issue um, uh, which one encounters, you know, throughout the world. I think one of the things that, um, that the, you know, the COVID and the pandemic has taught us is that there are ways around this. And I think that, um, you know, uh, we have seen arbitrations now being carried out, you know, sort of online uh, virtually mm. with great success. And so, you know, uh, and arguments have been raised as to whether that in itself um, uh, raises a problem about, you know, the ultimate enforceability of an award, but there are ways around of doing this by, by, by conducting arbitrations on a virtual basis. I think the other interesting issue is, you know, witnesses coming into the country. That's always been uh, a, a, a real difficulty, not so much a problem, perhaps, you know, when we're in the EU, but um, I, I once <laughs> wanted a witness to come across uh, from the Ukraine um, who happened to be an MP. And I spoke to the English High Commission in Kiev and said, um, you know, could we arrange a visa? And uh, she said, well, you know, you have to come for the usual interview and do this and do that. And I said, but, uh, you know, he's an MP. 
And she said, so what? So <laughs> I'm afraid that the, the helpfulness of, uh, of the bureaucrats in allowing witnesses to appear in uh, proceedings uh, it, it has not been great in the past. And I don't think they were going to see it any easier. But again, that is something that we have managed to overcome, I think, with the, the virtue, you know, listening, having witnesses giving their testimony uh, online, so, uh, and virtually. But uh, yes, there are those who will use the guerrilla tactics. I mean, and it's not just against counselors, against the arbitrators, you know, fam we're familiar with India and Indonesia as jurisdictions where the arbitrators themselves are injuncted. And, you know, there are horror stories even today about uh, arbitrators being injuncted, not allowed to uh, practice in certain jurisdictions. Uh, one would hope that that would never happen in the EU, but uh, it happens in other jurisdictions and we have mm. to be alive with that. And, and just on that last point that Jonathan made about arbitrators, I don't know if Eric has a point on this, but certainly I, I sometimes sit as arbitrator and I've got a couple of appointments on the continent. And so far my, my um, uh, I'm going to call, almost call them health and safety for this purpose. Our in-house team of lawyers are telling us that we're OK, that most of the European states have quite liberal rules in relation to arbitrators. The problem is more acting as counsel, certainly where there's anything outside of home jurisdiction and PIL. Is that, is that right, Eric? Yes, I think that's correct. Hmm. Yeah. So I think going forward, you know, we're just going to have to work with local correspondent lawyers. Um, you know, we got very used to that in certain jurisdictions, but not necessarily throughout the EU. But we're probably back to doing that again, um, you know, uh, in the future. Um, so, you know, the fly in, fly out. I mean, London is notorious as a fly in, fly out destination. I'm hoping that uh, we remain open and welcoming to all comers to conduct their arbitrations here. Um, whether that is, this, we get the same welcome is afforded on the continent remains to be seen, I think. And I, I, do, I do wonder whether the sort of the shift to virtual hearings, at the moment that's a short term solution and it certainly prevents the kind of, you know, being picked up at the airport point. Um, but I, I do wonder whether in the longer term you know, there will be steps taken to try and regulate bypassing what is otherwise a kind of, you know, a, a legitimate concern to protect, um, you know, parties dealing in, in those jurisdictions from, you know, lawyers effectively cheating the system by working virtually only. Um, you know, as Eric said, you know, the provision of service is the provision of service cross border, whether you're doing it virtually or in person. Yeah, um, it's now ne it's nevertheless the same, the same setup. So I whilst I think it provides a practical workaround at the moment, I, I think one, one can't assume that that by itself is going to be sufficient protection for the, the validity of the process as a whole. Um, and that's something that we do need to work with. But, you know, I agree with you, Jonathan, I think. You know, we historically have have always worked with local co-counsel exactly to make sure that we had proper representation in the room if a local law issue came up that we needed to address. Um, and that's obviously the right thing to do from, you know, from a client perspective and from a security of the process perspective. Um, so it may be that it'll actually lead to greater cross-border working and contacts with, you know, with our colleagues in Europe. And, and that can only be a good thing, I think. I always tell the anecdote. And I turned up in Dubai once, uh, my advocate turned up and he said to the judge, uh, Mr. Woods, come all the way from England to tell you about this case. I thought it was his job. So you just have to be careful how you instruct your local chorus. <laughs> but I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the, point, the last point that Philippa was making there. Um, looking, I, I too wondered about using virtual hearings as a way to get around some of these concerns. But I think uh, there's a serious risk, again, going back to what, what, Jonathan calls guerrilla tactics and I might call buggerization. If, if you're in London and you're presenting to us an arbitration seated in the EU and you start going into EU law or local law, I think um, there's a serious risk that um, uh, opposing counsel will say you can't do that. You may be sitting in London, but this is a, an arbitration not seated in London. This is an arbitration seated in the EU and therefore you can't be talking about EU law. So step away from ACNEA. You can't be talking about local law. So step away from that little bit you mentioned there on whatever law it is. Um, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and and it's, it, I think you're right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to 
accelerate good practice in the way that Jonathan and, and Philip have described. It's going to accelerate us working much more closely with, with other counts and other jurisdictions, whether our own offices or if we don't have on someone else, to make sure we're covering these, these things, not just in compliance with the TCA and local uh, restrictions, but also good practice and, and what we should be doing in any event. I, I think um, the, this question around virtual hearings and the use of technology is a, a neat segue into a, an audience question that we've had from, from Ben Gioretta, um, which asks, should we be focusing more on on-chain dispute resolution with automatic enforcement rather than older enforcement mechanisms or conventions? In, in other words, is, is this whole discussion um, rather 20th century? I, I'd be interested to, um, to hear everyone's views on that. Well, I am 20th century, so I'll, uh, I'll let Philippa and uh, Stuart talk about that. <laughs> oh, nice dodge there, Jonathan. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I'm very 20th century myself, but um, but no, I mean, look, I, I I do think there will be mechanisms in the future that will bypass some of these issues, absolutely. But I think if you look at the amount of on-chain dispute resolution that's currently happening, it's relatively small. I'm sure it will increase. Um, you know, there is pressure for it to do so, you know, people are adopting these new ways of working all the time, um, you know, cryptocurrency, um, you know, issues are, are starting to really proliferate now, um, you know, not just in terms of kind of the, the, the aspects of cryptocurrency that are specific, but also their use in commercial transactions. Um, so if you have an automatic mechanism for enforcement, then so much the better. And that's, that's great. But I think we're always going to have the kinds of traditional cases where you're going to need to take your award and enforce it somewhere else. You're going to need to do, um, you know, work in different jurisdictions along the way. And so I think, you know, the certainty and the streamlining of those approaches is is going to be important. And, and as I say, I mean, I think from the arbitrator's perspective, you know, the New York Convention at the moment provides a pretty good code for that um, and hopefully will continue to do so even in more sort of modern types of disputes. Um, but, you know, for the moment, the, you know, the status of English court judgments and the enforceability of English court judgments is something we're going to have to wrestle with. And we can't simply assume that it's going to be business as previous. Um, and so I think there's a there's a pretty steep learning curve for us. And, you know, and we're, we're going to need to do that work and get familiar with those those challenges um, to be effective for our clients. I think it's very important to make this point, and that is even if we don't accede to Nagano, you can and will be able to enforce English judgments in European countries. You know, that is not taken away from us. Uh, we go back to the old systems. There are certain treaties in place with some of these, uh, some of these countries, and Norway's one of them, for example. Uh, and, um, you know, you can enforce an English judgment in France uh, at the moment, even though we are not have, have not acceded to Lugano. So I, I don't think we should forget that uh, because you know the enforceability, as one of the commentators, one of the quest points made on the Q&A was, isn't enforceability the key issue? Well, yes, <laughs> no money, no honey. Uh, you know, so um, I think that's very important indeed, just to remember absent Lugano, we can still enforce. I, I think that's, that's a really important point, Jonathan. Um, I, I wanted to um, just address uh, something that we haven't touched upon um, so far, which is uh, mediation um, as well. Obviously, uh, this discussion is, is very much focused on arbitration, but one of the questions that has come up, uh, it's certainly something that I've um, been following very closely, is the Singapore Mediation Convention uh, and what the panellists' views are on, on UK accession um, to, to that and the, the, the broader utility of, uh, of the mediation convention. Does anyone have any uh, particular perspective? Well, I have a question uh, and uh, maybe the audience would like to come in. How many of you have ever had to enforce internationally a mediation settlement? And the, the number of lawyers I've asked that question since Singapore um, has been virtually Nil. Now, I've only ever had to do it once in uh, a very long uh, period of practice. Uh, but I, I think that the, the Singapore Convention is fantastic for as a, a herald towards mediation. Uh, the Chartered Institute had a, a very good uh, 
uh, a session the other evening uh, with a lady judge from Kenya who talked about the Singapore Convention, very well received. And um, but in terms of real, you know, nuts and bolts, hardline practitioners, I, I still ask that question. I don't know if the audience would like to say that they have had experience of having to enforce a mediation settlement uh, internationally, uh, absent the Singapore Convention. I don't know what any of my co-panelists think about that. Well, I mean, I've, I've certainly done cases in the past that arose out of a dispute about the implementation of mm -hmm. settlement agreement terms, but it hasn't tended to be by way of enforcement of the settlement agreement is normally because some some circumstance has changed um, or there's a fundamental lack of agreement between the parties as to what they are said to have agreed. So, um, you know, so I, so I do, you know, those those disputes happen, but I'm not sure they fall within the scope of the, um, the new convention. But I agree with you, Jonathan, I think pointing parties to mediation and, and really stressing its effectiveness, I think, is incredibly important as part of a well-rounded offering for dispute resolution clients. Um, you know, in a jurisdiction which is now regarded as sort of, you know, for luxury users only, um, you know, in terms of England being deemed to be an expensive place to, to litigate. Um, I do think that stressing the availability of effective um, ADR is important. But, but ultimately, I think if you have a well-drafted settlement agreement, you know, you enforce it in the way that you would any other contract. Um, and I'm not sure that you need the mediation convention for that, but I do think it serves the right purpose, as you say, for, for giving parties comfort that, that that is something that is recognised and enforceable and not simply an ephemeral um, attempt to, to resolve disputes. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said, Philippa. And I, I note that um, if, if what the Singapore Convention is trying to do is encourage mediation in, in international disputes, that's a, that's a great and very worthy motive. In arbitration, which most of the people on this call are specialists in, if we have a mediated solution within an, agree within an agreement that provides for arbitration or within an extant arbitration, we'll most likely reduce it to a consent award. And so then we have the benefits of the New York Convention to enforce that. OK, it's a, it's a mediated settlement, but it's then reduced to an award, which you can then enforce under the New York Convention. Um, so I see, I see the, New York, the Singapore Convention as being perhaps more apposite in cases where there's litigation in the agreement or, or an arbitration hasn't been started um, and you can you can get the benefits of the Singapore Convention um, to a mediated settlement in those cases. But um, I, I think so. So, you know, it, it's probably another thing that helps a bit in light of uh, the UK leaving, um, leaving the EU and maybe not having access to Lugano for a mediated settlement in a case arising where there's no arbitration ability, you, you've, got, you've got the Singapore Convention. And I, as I think I recall, whilst the UK is not proposing yet to sign up to the Singapore Convention, um, if, you're, if you're a UK party and you have a settlement that provides, that, that's to be performed in a country that has signed up, you can still take action in that country, notwithstanding that you're a UK resident and, you, and the UK itself has not signed up to the Singapore Convention. I, I think that's uh, that they're all very good points, and particularly that uh, the distinction between the role of the convention in normalising, in inverted commas, uh, mediation uh, as a settlement mechanism, and actually fulfilling the uh, the role that perhaps the New York Convention does for arbitration, which is obviously a very different um, kettle of fish. Um, I'm afraid that we've we've reached the uh, the limit of our our time for the discussion here today. Um, I know. Clearly, we, we could have spent uh, another hour and a half and, and certainly beyond discussing these issues. I certainly found it a, a really uh, illuminating and, um, and, and uh, an interesting discussion. Um, I wanted to say thank you to all of our panellists uh, for joining today and, and sharing their um, very well-founded uh, views with us. Uh, I also wanted to, to thank our, our audience members both from the Chartered Institute and the, and the Law Society uh, for joining and, and also sharing your questions. And finally, I also wanted to, um, to thank uh, the teams both at the Chartered Institute and the Law Society for putting on this event today. It's, it's been a, a fantastic collaboration and, uh, and something that I hope we can, can emulate again in the near future. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody, bye.